We'll use these in a little bit. So when I was in first grade, we'd start out every week with a new list of spelling words. And there was always a different theme to it. And one week in particular, uh, the theme was colors. And there was just something about orange and yellow I, I couldn't spell. And so as much as I practiced at home, by the time our spelling test rolled around on Friday, I wasn't going to do well. And I knew that. So in my little first grade desk, you know, there's a little, there's a cubby. Well, I put my practice sheet right there on the corner. And Friday morning, there I was, scribbling down the right answers. And I went home that afternoon. My first grade teacher checks them during the day and gave it to us to take home for the weekend. And when I got home, I ripped the test out of my book bag and I showed my parents and I was expecting this look of joy and admiration. Uh, instead, my mom gave me this sort of inquisitive and questioning look. And the next thing out of her mouth was, spell the word yellow. <sighs> I was busted. I was done. And all she said to me is that Monday morning, you have to go in and tell Mrs. Jones what you have done. That was the worst possible punishment. Because what I didn't tell you about Mrs. Jones is that if she wasn't a first grade teacher, she would have had a very lucrative career as a linebacker in the NFL. She was this imposing woman that, that could terrify a first grader, even a grown adult probably. And I remember Monday morning when I got on the bus, I was wearing this, this gray hooded sweatshirt because it had these drawstrings on it and I was gnawing on the drawstrings the entire bus ride to school. And when I got up to her desk at the beginning of the, the class and these sort of blubbering first grade tears, I told her what I had done. And she didn't like jump up and snap me in half like I was anticipating. Uh, instead, she did something even worse. She told me she was disappointed in me. And at the time, I didn't really fully understand what that meant. But I realize now that her disappointment came because she cared about me. You can't be disappointed in someone if you don't truly care for them. And so I was more than just a student in her class. I was her child. For 180 days, when I sat in her room, I wasn't just there to absorb knowledge, but I was a child of hers. And I had a lot of these experiences I went through school, not, not cheating on tests, uh, but being treated as a real child by my teachers. And when I became a teacher, I wanted to do the same thing. I wanted to always make sure to not forget about the child who was sitting in the classroom. And one thing I learned very quickly is the children who sit in our classes are very, very different. In one chair, you might have a child who was read to in the womb, and when they weren't being read to, they had those little baby bump headphones blaring Mozart in there, and by the age of three, that child could know all their letters, and by four, they spelled their colors better than I did in first grade. But right next to them, you might have another child where books were scarce in their house and education wasn't as highly valued as what everyone would hope. And their dinner table wasn't full of meals and conversation, but it had everything else. And what else do I know about them? Well, I know on average, we spend around $150,000 in this country educating children from kindergarten through 12th grade. But I also know that we rank behind 20 other nations in reading math and science literacy. And I know we can do better. And I think there are a lot of ideas out there how to do better. But I think the one problem is a lot of the ideas forget about one thing. And it's something Mrs. Jones would never have forgotten about. And it's the child who sits in these chairs. So what are some of the fixes? Let's talk about them. So let's say we're in third grade. In third grade, we're going to learn fractions. And fractions are just hard. So here's a fix. We're going to try online video learning. You're going to go home, you're going to watch a lesson, and you're going to come back to school and practice it. Well, this child, they go home. But mom can't help. Mom was at the PTA meeting that night, so dad does. And dad cues up the video, and they talk about it. They rewind. They go through examples. They even take their snack and split it up, and they see fractions. Well, the other child goes home, and there's no one there to help. 
Both parents are out working. And so they queue up the video, they're ready to learn, and a younger sibling comes barging through and interrupts the whole beginning of the lesson. And now they're even more frustrated to go to school the next day. So we have to understand that some learning for students, unfortunately, can only take place in the classroom. But as third grade continues, we need to figure out what they learned. And what better way to do that than through some standardized test that's made by some faraway corporation driven only by profit, the results of which we're not going to see for months. Well, we find out some children were proficient and passed their test, and then we find that others uh, weren't. So that must tell us one thing. It tells us that teacher must not have been very good. I dare I even say the word in a room of educators, uh, unsatisfactory. But what's not on those results? Well, the child didn't take a test in second grade. So we can't actually see that they grew over a year and a half of academic growth. Or that their social interactions, which were once down here, are now up here. Or that that teacher made sure to get that child a card and a treat and a small gift on their birthday. Or that on Fridays, that teacher would jam food in their backpack so that that kid could eat over the weekend. That's not on any test. There's no measurement for that. But it happens every day. So we're going to go on to fourth grade. And in fourth grade, now we have two problems that plague all across the country. Budget cuts and bad test scores. So what's the first thing to go? Art and music. And now neither child has the opportunity to create and design and build and play. And this child, they're so far behind academically that well, we, need to, we need to give them more instruction. Let's use recess. And so now throughout the entire day, there is zero time to decompress, to play, to imagine, to be a fourth grader. And by fifth grade, it's the same story in, in middle school. Well, let's just take these problems and we'll throw in hormones, puberty, and a cell phone, and let's just skip right past that. And by the time we get to high school, these chairs might even be in different classrooms or even different schools within a district. You might have one in an accelerated college track, and this one sits in a general studies room. And they're probably studying some sort of classic novel. And the teacher might have the greatest lesson in the world. It might run nine weeks, and they're going to make videos and reenact scenes and go through character development and plot. But they can't do it. Why? Because of another fix. Some national standards, the common core. You know, it's the assembly line method of instruction, that every child's going to learn the same things. But if you think about a real assembly line, at the beginning of every line, there's a person called quality control. And they make sure that the products coming in are all the same. Well, could you imagine if when students got off the bus every day, we had our quality control person there, uh, just sending ones that weren't ready for school that day home? Or, or at the beginning of the school year, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, uh, your son or daughter, they just haven't met our receiving standards. Um, they're going to have to go home for a while. We can't do that. We would never do that. Anyone who ever got an education would never think to do that. Because these children are different. At this point, you know, some children are going to be very academically inclined, and they're going to go on to college, and they're going to do very well. But there are going to be other students who are just bored. You know, teachers will sometimes say they're a little bit difficult to handle. That's teacher speak for, this kid hates school. And I mean, I can't imagine why. We make them sit there at a desk for seven hours a day to try to prove on a standardized test that they're the same when they're anything but the same. We can only hope that these students will make a connection with a teacher. And oftentimes, those connections are going to be made with shop teachers, art teachers, music teachers, tech teachers. The teachers where the kids can get up and build and do things and create things. You know, these are the connections where years later these kids will come back and they will say thank you for introducing me to that, to putting me down that path. I don't think it's ever happened that a, that a student has ever come back to a teacher and said, hey, thanks for helping me pass that standardized test. That, that lesson on, on binomials, that was killer. That doesn't happen 10 years after you leave school. 
It's not the conversation that exists. But now, the same problems come up. Budget cuts, low test scores. And so who has to go? Well, it's that teacher that this child has that deep connection with. And that teacher comes in early, stays late, enriches every child's life. And why do they have to go? Well, because they're probably the youngest. And tradition says, whoever has been here longer must be a better teacher, because that's who always gets to stay. Well, that's not a fix for education. Well, what about technology? Can we use technology to fix education? Absolutely. It can certainly be a part of it. But alone, it's not going to fix anything. So what is the fix? I don't know. But I do know this. I know that it's not one thing, it's not one idea, it's not one person, it's not one group. The only way to truly fix education is to make very deep and lasting and honest connections with one goal in mind. And the goal in mind is doing what's best for these children. Because I think we have to ask ourselves, is what we do now the very best that we can? And that answer is no. And because that answer is no, we must transform what we do. And we have to do it for this child, and this child, and the 50 million children who sit in the same chairs, but are all different. Thank you.